My guest today is Barry Stahl. Barry, how are you? Excellent. How are you doing, David? I'm doing really well. Uh, we met at Code Mash, but I don't know if you remember this, but we actually met at a Give Camp many years ago when you were traveling up to Michigan. Uh, I do. When I was, I, I used to be heavily involved in Give Camps. I, I still am. I'm really I'm looking so forward to uh, the days we can have them in person again. Yeah. Um, but let's not talk about that today. Today, let's talk about, um, what are you, do you tell me, what should we talk about? Well, what I've been talking a lot about lately is uh, the dual rights anti-pattern and how to avoid it. Um, so a, a dual right occurs when you try to do two things, or at least more than one thing, um, you, where you try and change the system state in more than one way in a single execution context. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you're in a uh, web API call and you try and both send an email and do a database update in the same API call, you can't do that reliably. There's actually no way to, to make that reliable and consistent. So, Why, why is that? Why is that not possible? Uh, well, if, it's really hard to motivate. Um, and I'm doing some, I'm working on some code examples that actually kind of lay it out. Uh, and there's, you know, there's example there. People talk about the, the two generals problem, which you're probably familiar with. And I don't think I am. Tell me. No. Oh, well, it's, it's far more detailed than I think we want to go into here, but, uh, ultimately it comes down to how do you communicate back and forth when you have two unreliable actors, like between, for example, with a network in between them, Okay. how can you actually communicate back and forth with them and be certain that both the messages were received and that the acknowledgement to them was received so that you know that both are synchronized, both ends of that okay. unreliable pipe are synchronized. Oh, okay. So you're talking about unreliable messaging. A lot of, uh, I'm thinking of atomic transactions. We want them both to succeed or, or we want them both to fail. Is that, is that really the challenge? Well, so within one of these execution, so we know, for example, that you can do distributed transactions, right? Okay. So if you have email and a database, an asset database, uh, database um, action, um, you can synchronize the database to itself. So anything happening within that database transaction succeeds or fails together. But there's no way to do that over, say, an email in a database or two email um to email sends without using like a distributed transaction, which distributed transactions absolutely destroy scalability. I so see. generally we don't want to do those. Okay. Uh, do people do try to do things like they'll try and um, I'll start a SQL transaction, for example, and then do send the email and then roll back the SQL transaction if that fails. But it turns out if the, if the email send fails, but it turns out that actually makes it worse, not better, uh, because the transaction can fail at any time during that process. Any time the transaction is open, it can fail. So if the email then sends and then the transaction fails, you're still in, a, in an unknown state. Right. So and if you think about email, which is really just a three nines kind of it, it's not very reliable. Um, so you, if you have do, trying to do those two things, you end up with an inconsistent state depending on how you do it. So you probably do email first, right? Because it's unreliable. So you, right. if you, you go into a web API, you send the email and then only if that works, do you do the database update? And that's probably going to be the most reliable way you could do those two changes to system state within the right. same context. But that means that whatever the percentage of the time that the email succeeds and the database fails, you're in an inconsistent state. You don't have, you've done one, but not the other. And you don't have any tools in production that do exactly that thing you need to fix it. Sure. There, uh, the, there's an unsend email button in Outlook, but it doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> if anybody's opened that email and it doesn't, you can't like it, have them unsee it. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's no way to call it back. It's absolutely. You can't uh, do a com compensating transaction right. for email. Right. And, you know, compensating transactions are one way to try and handle these kinds of things. Uh, but there's complexity there. Right. And there's no, um, there's no tool that will do that base. That's 
also part of your normal process. So if you create a separate tool, like uh, something that could happen here is we could say, all right, uh, if the first thing succeeded, but the second one failed, we're going to push that off to another thing, uh, maybe a message queue or something like that. And then we'll know that anything in that message queue only had the first thing succeed, but the second thing fail. And so we have to do the second thing only, mm -hmm. which means now we're duplicating the code for the second thing. Right. And that process only runs under rare conditions, which means it's more likely to atrophy and not get changed when we need to. And uh, mm. there's a lot of problems with that kind of process. So it's really better to separate those processes at the beginning because you need to have that service that does the second thing anyways. So why not have a separate service that does the, both the first thing and the second thing and kind of chain them together and do them separately from the start? I see. And these are the patterns that you talk about that will uh, uh, get away from this dual right anti-pattern that you described initially. Right. I talk about three patterns that are, are really, they're very, very similar patterns. And they can be used to um, basically separate these things from each other so that you're only doing one thing at a time. Uh, the most common of them, I think, is uh, the streaming data pattern where you push it into you push a message into a uh, topic like a service bus topic or uh, Redis streaming or something like that, Kafka, um, and that, and then both you you have two different consumers to that stream, and those consumers then will each take those actions individually. So okay. you're eventually consistent. You know that if one fails, it will roll back and then try again later. Uh, right. So eventually, you will have consistency, and both of both of them will be done. Okay, that's the streaming data pattern. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And CDC and Outbox are actually very, very similar. They basically persist the data somewhere, and then take downstream actions to it. Outbox uses a database to uh, write in a inside a transaction two records. One that's the actual data that you need to write, and the other is the kind of event that you would then act on downstream. Um, mm -hmm. I don't recommend that if you can avoid it because you're using the database like a queue. And yes. we have better we have better tools for that kind of thing. I see. But if you're already making a database right and that database right is atomic, it's one thing you can do. And it's a, oh, it's okay. a good pattern. It's just not the ideal pattern in many cases. Uh, right. CDC is really good if you're using like uh, Cosmos DB. Cosmos mm -hmm. is amazing for CDC. Um, you write a message out to Cosmos and you get the change feed from that. And the SDK for Cosmos handles all the complexity of it for you. It handles the scale mm -hmm. out and all the all the pieces to it. Uh, so you can you can just write something into Cosmos. You'll get a copy of that in your change feed which is an event then that can trigger a downstream action. So this is like a, uh, there's a trigger on adding a, a record to Cosmos DB that then fires off these actions that have to occur. Is that the yep. idea? And you have okay. to respond to those in your downstream code. So you'd have one piece of code for, if it's a write to the database, then write, send the email, um, you write it to Cosmos DB and then that sends the email or, and then that actually, sorry, uh, triggers the downstream action to send the email. Or you can write a, an event to Cosmos DB, which can trigger two downstream actions, one to update maybe a SQL database, another to uh, send the email. Uh, oh, the CDC stands for something? Change data capture. Change data capture, okay. okay. And uh, many, many databases support it. SQL Server supports it in many uh, SKUs, but not all of them. Uh, okay. So if you're using like an Azure Cloud instance, it doesn't support it, uh, but most local versions of SQL support it. What's your favorite of these patterns? I'm, I'm a streaming data guy. I like to, uh, I, I tend to use uh, Cosmos DB or um, Azure Service Bus. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll push data to that first. So like if I get a message into a web API, from mm -hmm. an external consumer, or from a UI or something like that, I'll push that message into a, uh, let's say a Kafka topic. And mm -hmm. now that it's safe, it's in there, it's persisted to disk. I can respond with a, you know, a GUID or a token or something that says, yep, here's your, here's your token, you call her, 
uh, we're good, I got the data. And then I can take as many actions as I want on that because I've safely got the data. I've stored yeah. it, and now I, whatever I need to do with it, I can fan it out, I can make them, things happen in parallel, I can uh, orchestrate it with a with a, an orchestrator like in a saga pattern, or have a choreography where one service pushes out to another topic, which then is read by another service, which calls another, which does another thing. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility in those kind of patterns, and that's what I tend to prefer. Okay, yeah, and then you didn't really uh, mention this, but another advantage is that if we drop something onto something like a service bus, that tends to be very, very fast. And then we can get on, our, our client can get on doing whatever it needs to do. It doesn't have to sit there and wait for, you know, sending an email can take seconds, which is mm -hmm. a big deal when you have to send out a thousand of them. <laughs> yeah, get only, do the minimum you can do and it's, it, it, I tend to think of it for safety, but you're right. It's also for speed and, and scalability. Uh, yeah. Do as little as you can do first. Get right. the client a response that says you're good. Because yeah. the shorter you hold that connection open with the client, the more reliable it is, too. Yeah, um, good point. Um, yeah, and you could, of course, write code to do all this asynchronous stuff. But these buses, they, they just take it, <laughs> care of all that for you. Well, and that's all in memory, generally. So if you have a hardware failure there, which our commodity hardware is... Not perfect. Uh, fair point. <laughs> so, yeah, get it to disk as quickly as you can. Uh, now, you speak about this. Uh, I know you were at CodeMash giving a talk on this. Is this uh, um, where, uh, where's another good place for people to go and learn these patterns? Oh, that's a good question. So, I have some resources in my slide decks. Um, oh, I have your slide deck open here. It's probably on the last slide, I'll bet. It's, the, yeah, the one labeled resources. Uh, I'll have to go all the way down to the bottom here. <laughs> And uh, oh, my slide that's not working. Um, do it. <laughs> you know, there is another thing we should talk about probably, and that's uh, I'm just seeing it on my resources slide. So, I'm, uh, and that's uh, yeah. item potence. Um, item potence is another is another thing we can do to make our our uh, processes more reliable because. Uh, yeah, if, first, first define that term, item potency. Absolutely. So item potency is being able to do something multiple times and have it the same as if it would have happened exactly once. Right. So email, sending an email is not an item potent operation because if I send the email twice, I'm going to get two copies of that email downstream. So the state has changed, is different. Uh, on the other hand, doing, say, a database upsert that as long as I give it the same data every time, it's going to do end up with the same state in the database because right. I'm up, you know, the first time I insert it, the second and third and fourth times, it just updates it. And then since I'm sending it the same data, it's updating it to the same state. Got it. So if we make our downstreams item potent, then we can kind of do them reliably because that first um, that first action uh, we, is if that's item potent and it succeeds, but the second thing fails, well, we could just roll back, try again. So we roll back the whole process, try again. If we do the first thing again, it doesn't matter because that's item potent. And then we do, and then hopefully the second thing succeeds the next time. So item potence is actually a really important concept um, in in these kinds of systems. Um, and the more we can make things item potent, the more reliable and, and uh, maintainable our systems are going to be. Right. The fact is, when we get into situations when we're when we're our state is unknown, it just makes it that much harder to to maintain and to debug and troubleshoot and uh, fix problems when they occur. Because problems will occur. But it's as long as the the more things we throw into them. And the more uh, different paths we have that we have to deal with separately because of failures, uh, the more the harder it is to uh, troubleshoot them downstream. And these are our nights and weekends that we're going to be spending <laughs> troubleshooting these things, right? So, yeah, you're right. I mean, the the cloud is great, distributed systems are great, but there's more moving parts and there's more chance of failure. And uh, uh, often, in, uh, rather than uh, the old days, we'd have immense amounts of hardware to minimize the chance of failure. Now we would just get better at handling failures, except that it's part of our processes. Yeah. Um, I, I noticed there's one pattern you didn't talk about that is in your slide deck, the saga pattern. Is that important? 
So sagas are just ways of of coordinating all these different things. So there's really two ways to have a saga, um, orchestration and choreography. Um, so a saga orchestration is when you have kind of one orchestrator. You have one, um, I think of it as a single point of failure because it can be, but if you do things right, it, it won't be because you can it can fail and then spin back up and you have uh, messages and cues and things that'll allow it to figure out where it is. But um, it's the thing that's coordinating all the actions. So it's it knows, this orchestrator knows, okay, when I get a signal like this from this service, that means I have to tell this other service to do this thing. Okay. And it's different from having all the services kind of know what they're, I, I, I don't think of it that way, but it, that's how other people do think of it is um, the service uh, choreography is when a service knows to, it gets a message from something, it does its work, and then it publishes a new message. And then any downstream consumers then consume that message and do their work. So you're always aware of your upstream. You're less aware of your downstream, but um, you have to consume, transform the message, and then produce a new message. And ultimately, by putting all of those streams together, you end up with a choreography, a choreographed saga. Okay, um, I think that I get this. It's a, I think of these as... Um like orchestration tools that uh, tie together a lot of these, uh, the, the, the smaller transactional things that you were talking about earlier. Yep. That's, that sounds like that's what the saga is, is uh, that, that high level orchestration that, that, that has some, it knows about the entire process. Exactly. Uh, and, and then I'm, I'm still looking at your slide deck here. It's, uh, and uh, the very last bullet point of your summary is never add on. What do you mean by that? Okay. So, we're developers. We tend to think of the simplest solution that could possibly work first, which is a good thing to do, Jim. So, some of us do. <laughs> um, I'm a TDD guy, so I always do. But uh, uh, yes. Uh, so the simplest thing, if you're, suppose you have a, a service that just writes to a database. So take a web API call uh, and write the data out to the database. And now we get a new... Um, a, a new requirement that says, oh, and by the way, we also need to send an email. And we need to send that email you know, based on the, at the same time. We need, to, we need to write it to the database and send the email. Well, the simplest thing that could possibly work is to just inside that web API, just add on, just add the email right into that execution context. Oh, yeah. But as we've and already that's, discussed- that's bad. It, it doesn't it makes your systems less reliable and it means that you're going to be spending more of your nights and weekends uh, figuring these things out uh, trying to figure out why the state um, isn't what you expect it to be and now if you expand that out right if it's not just doing two things but it's five six or seven things yeah. imagine how many different ways your system state can be inconsistent yeah it, it increases exponentially as you add to it I would think so so uh, so yeah, so don't add on. Don't just say, I've got this thing here. It's already doing it. What you want to do, ideally, uh, is I've got this event that's already occurring that I can just create, I can subscribe to that event and do my work. So that's how you want to add on is by kind of fanning out by um, mm -hmm. the, your, you've already got a message that is produced that triggers that that is the mm -hmm. needed trigger for that thing subscribe to that event do your work so you're not adding on to something else and that also does you know it it better fits the uh, single responsibility principle uh it makes it so that you can scale those things independently because you're deploying them independently so now if one is a lot more cpu intensive than the other you're not scaling them both together you can scale them independently, that kind of thing. Excellent. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Well, we should talk more about GiveCamp. Uh, yeah. Is, well, <laughs> uh, is there one coming up? No. Uh, well, there's. Uh, we're still trying to figure out what the what the best way to do is. We're looking at different ways of doing online gift camps. Uh, because we don't want we don't want to put anybody in any in any risk at all, uh, but as you and I I think found out, 
at Code Mash, uh, the social aspect is important too. Yeah. Um, it was it was really good seeing everybody. But then again, Agreed. we've also had at least two K two people I know that we both hung out with have uh, one where they tested positive and one where they were just really sick and believe it to have been COVID. Uh, There's uh, one person on this call who has tested positive. Okay, so that makes three people that I know of now that are likely to have been uh, who have, to have contracted COVID at that conference. Um, so uh, that concerns me. I actually Sorry. just today got free from my COVID isolation for this. Um, You're out of COVID prison. I'm out of COVID prison now, and I'm back home. Uh, but that was about two hours ago that I got home from uh, staying in isolation away from the family because I don't want to put them at risk. Yeah. But it also it's important to me to have this kind of uh, uh, to 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 see people in person, and it, and it was really good to see everybody. And uh, it definitely was. I mean, this is a uh, technology and friends. To uh, podcast so that, yes. i mean that was the friends part and uh, it was really good to see everybody it was good to see you so yes are you, where are you speaking next uh that'll be at code stock in april excellent and that's in person isn't it yes uh excellent. as of right now and i hope it will continue that hopefully we're on the downward slide of omicron and uh, fingers um, crossed right <laughs> <laughs> as long as we can keep people from churning out a new variant um yeah. Well, Barry, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for all this information and for uh, hanging out at Code Match with me. Thank you. It was good seeing you. I want to make sure everybody is uh, aware and, and, and knows how much I, I, I feel that this is important. The... We are in the downward slide of the Omicron variant right now when this is being recorded. And it, the social aspect of what we do is very, very important. But that we can't do that unless we're safe. So I just want to tell everyone, all of my technology friends out there and all of my friends in general, please be safe first. Put safety first. And then we'll be able to get back together soon and, and you know, be in person and, and do our thing like we always do. But uh, stay safe first. And uh, I hope all of you are safe and healthy and happy. And uh, thank you for this opportunity, David. <laughs>